Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for Jesus Christ. There'd be no point in us gathering here this morning if it was not for him. And it is to that lamb who was slain, who is worthy of all glory, all honor and power. Father, that we sing and that we concentrate on your word this morning for his glory, for his honor. He is our head. And this is his church. Father, may we remember that. I pray this morning as we look into Psalm 19 that your word would be impactful in our lives. It changes. It transforms us. Father, may you take each of us one more step in that transformation process this morning. We pray this in the name of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are in Psalm 19 this morning. We're going to, if you remember back in November, we covered verses 1 through 6 in, in our last Psalm Sunday. 1 through 6 is about special, or I'm sorry, general. My son said I messed this up last time too. General revelation. <laughs> It speaks of the, that the heavens declare the glory of God. And we went to Romans 1 to see what we can know, what we should know about God because of his general revelation to us. And what can we know? You know, I think as believers, one, one important thing that we can know, I shared this with our Sunday school class this morning, is we can know from Romans 1 that through general revelation, the world knows there's God. They know. When you go to share the gospel with someone, you don't have to spend time proving there's God. They already know. Why? Because they're suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness. But they know. They know. You have one up <laughs> on someone when you go share the gospel. And, and, and I, I've said before, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time trying to prove the existence of God to someone, I just share the gospel. And the Holy Spirit can do His work as He desires. And so we talked about how general revelation, the goal of general revelation ultimately is to drive us to what we're going to talk about today, the special revelation of God. Specifically today, what we have as special revelation is His Word. Now you could say, well, is Jesus not special revelation? Absolutely. For us, how we learn about Jesus is through His Word, right? Isn't that how we learn? So the Gospels were written to tell us all about Jesus, and, and the apostles wrote about Him, and, and John said, you know, we have handled Him, we have touched Him, we have seen Him with our eyes. Special revelation, Jesus Christ. And it's revealed to us today through His Word. The Holy Spirit illuminates His Word right? The Holy Spirit illuminates what's there for us to learn. And so the general revelation is designed to drive us into the special revelation of God. And so let's talk about that from Psalm 19 this morning. I appreciate Andrew being willing to read. And first we see here the working of the word. And, and this is a Psalm of David. David writes this and he gives us six phrases in these first three verses, seven through nine. He gives us six phrases that are descriptors, but that talk about how the Word of God works. So let's begin in verse seven. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The law of the Lord, in David's day and even today, we would still say the law refers to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The law of the Lord. That's what that means. Now, when he uses these various phrases, because in, in, in later in that verse, he's going to say the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord. What we should understand is he is talking about the Word of God. He's talking about God's special revelation. Now, these are various aspects of the revelation of God, various descriptions of them. But remember, he because later on he's going to say, and they, them, these. He's talking about the Word of God, the revelation of God. All as one thing, but different aspects to God's revelation. And here he talks about the law of the Lord is perfect. 
We live in a culture where many churches don't want to preach about the law of the Lord. They want to touch that. That's Old Testament, right? We're going to unhitch from the Old Testament, one pastor has said, one famous pastor has said, and I've said to you, we're not unhitching at all from the Old Testament. You know, our faith was built, or our, our church is built on what? The foundation laid by the prophets and the apostles. Old Testament, New Testament. And we don't unhitch at all from the Old Testament. I don't want to apologize. I don't need to apologize for the Old Testament. I have no apology to make for what the Old Testament says. You say, but there's some things in there, Pastor, that my neighbor would be like, ah, oh, you believe that to be true? We need to understand it grammatically, historically, in context, and there's, there's a way to understand the Word of God truly and rightly. But I'm not apologizing for it. I'm going to study it and know it. The law of the Lord, it's perfect. That idea is you can't improve on it. <laughs> you cannot improve on it. The law of God cannot be improved upon. You know, there's not like something you could say, well, if I added this, it'd be better. <laughs> nope. Or if we took away that, it would just improve it just a little. No. It is perfect, spotless, blameless, exactly as it needs to be. When I share the gospel with someone, usually I take them to the law to show them how the law is perfect and you're not. <laughs> right? That's what we need to know because Jesus came to save sinners. If you're not a sinner, he didn't come for you. But he came for you <laughs> because you're a sinner. So we take people to the law of the Lord. It's perfect. And it revives the soul. You say, Paul, when Paul wrote about the law, he said it's it kills. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it shows me my sinfulness. Yes, it does. That's why I take people and share the gospel to the law. It shows me. Well, how does that revive my soul? Because I can take a look at the law and see how I fall short and say, I need someone to rescue me. I need a Savior. Oh, I have good news for you. Jesus is a Savior. And he came to save sinners. So as you take someone to the law of the Lord and show its perfection, and then you take them and show them how they are not perfect, and they realize their need, and they come to Jesus, guess what? Their soul is revived. It turns that soul to repentance, is the idea in play here. It takes that soul and causes them to repent, to turn. Repentance, really, the root, root of that word is change your mind. That's it. Change your mind. It's a change of mind. And I've, I've had a friend once, I remember him saying, it can't, it's got to be more than that. And I said, no, no, that's what it means. And, but, but it's got to mean more than that. I'm like, if, if you really change your mind, it changes everything else. Right? I know people who have had heart attacks in their life who change their mind about how they need to eat from now on. And they, they, they ate differently after that. <laughs> they cut out different things out of it because this caused them to have a repentance moment, right? Change my mind. And that heart attack helped them change their mind. And they lived differently afterwards. I remember my uncle, I've shared this before, after he got diagnosed with lung cancer, he quit smoking. <laughs> a little late, and he died about a year later. But there was a repentance moment. He's a believer. He was a believer in before, he, before he got diagnosed, but he always struggled with that. But God used cancer to cause him to repent of what he was living and, and, and change some things in his life. Isn't that amazing what God does? He brings us to repentance, but the Word of God is able to bring you to a point of repentance. That is a working of the Word. And then secondly, in the same verse, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God's word is immutable, doesn't change. What God speaks, his testimony, does not change. And this should be a good comfort to you. You ever played a board game with a young child that changes the rules? <laughs> <laughs> you know, as, as, soon, as soon as you start to win, no, 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 you can't do that. What do, you, what do you mean I can't do that? No, no, the rule is, 
okay, little one, you know, <laughs> and, and they keep changing the rules until they win, right? <laughs> no, it's the one with the lowest points that wins. It's like golf. <laughs> Sorry, you lose. They change the rules. God doesn't change the rules. Doesn't change. His word does not change. What he says stands firm is the idea. It's solid. I'm glad we're not on shifting sand, but we stand on a solid rock of Jesus Christ, and he does not change. I'm so thankful for that. Can you imagine if you had a, had a parent that you had to live in their household, and they just constantly were changing the expectations of you? You'd go crazy. God's not like that. He says, this is my word. It won't change. It's reliable. It's one of the reasons we go to the word of God. We don't believe there's, there's more revelation today. Because that would start to change what he has said. No, the revelation he's given is a revelation we have. It's not changeable. It's immutable. And it's able to make one wise. Now, Proverbs <laughs> talks about the wise, the fool, and the simple. Now, here we see it's able to make someone who's simple wise. When it comes to the wise and the fool... They know. They've learned. The wise has said, I agree. And I'll live my life in light of the truth that I have been revealed that's been revealed to me. The fool says, I don't agree, and I'm gonna live my life the way I want to, and I don't care what the truth is. That's the fool. And then there's the simple. I would venture to guess that while there are foolish people and while there are wise people, I would say the vast majority of people in our culture today are simple. They don't know. They just don't know. They're ignorant. I mean, yes, they know there's God. They do know that much. We know that from the general revelation. But then they're like, who is he? Let me tell you this. When I share the gospel with people, I've, I've, I've rarely had someone say, I've heard this before. They almost always were like, never heard that before. I <laughs> had a guy in our office this week <laughs> who I shared the gospel with. And as he left, he didn't show up, but he said, <laughs> he said, you're crazy. <laughs> I might just have to come to church here. <laughs> you're crazy. Why? Because I was unlike anybody, any pastor he's ever met. Why? Because I'm crazy? Maybe. But that's another issue. No, it's, be, it's because I gave him the truth, the gospel. And, and he realized I could be set free from my life of sin, from, from all the wickedness. This guy was a murderer, by the way. He told me that. I mean, I could be set free from all of that. I could be not guilty. You're crazy, man. Yeah. It's, it seems crazy what God has done from our perspective, right? It's not crazy. You know, when, when, I hate that song, Reckless Love. God's not reckless. His love is very specific. <laughs> he's not crazy with his love. It seems nuts to us, but he's very intentional. We'll learn that more next week. He is very intentional with his love. It's not reckless. It's not crazy. But to the world, it seems crazy. In fact, <laughs> Paul said, it's foolishness to the world. That's foolishness makes no sense to them. It makes wise the simple. If you're simple this morning, the Word of God will make you wise. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. This idea of precepts, I said, we're not going to go into too much detail of each of these aspects, but the idea of precepts is God's kind of gentle nudging along down the right path, saying, you know, this is the right path, walk in that. Doesn't God do that for us so often? This is the right path. This is where I want you to walk. And he just gently prods us along a lot of times. I'm thankful for that. In his grace and mercy that he sometimes just, just he just puts me on the path and says, walk this way. He's so good to us that way. And that's the idea of precepts and their level. Now, you know, we've been in Ohio a year and a half. We went for a lot of walks last summer. Not so much in the winter. But last summer, we went for a lot of walks. The sidewalks where we live, maybe they're this way everywhere in Ohio. I don't know. But, like, one's here and the next one's here. It's like, yeah, there's, like, stairs sometimes, you know, and then go down on the next one. I, mean, I can't tell you how many times my wife and I be walking along, all of a sudden one of us, whoa, we almost fall over because our toe hits that edge, right? Because it's not level. I, don't, I mean, I, I st we still walked it, and no matter how many times we walked that same loop, we still tripped on different spots. But, but the reality is, is it wasn't level. 
But if you walk the path God directs you on, no stumbling. You won't stumble. If you stay on his path, you won't stumble. I like that. <laughs> I, li I wish Hawaii, Wisconsin, Wisconsin sidewalks seem so much more level than Ohio's. I'm just telling you. I like a level sidewalk. I'll learn to live with it. But <laughs> it gives one joy. So how does it give one joy? Well, I tell, we, we have, this has not happened to us. But if I stumbled and I fell on my face on my nose, I would not have joy. <laughs> and if it happened to my wife, I would not have joy still for her, right? I'd be like, oh no. It would not give me joy. But when I walk on a level path, I could skip sidewalks if they were level. Yeah, a big fat pastor can skip if he wanted to on sidewalks if they were level. But I would never do that on unlevel ground. I would never walk joyfully like that on unlevel ground. But God's direction, smooth, straight. It's not a lot of guesswork involved. <laughs> you just keep walking the path and he directs you. The end of verse 8. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The idea of commandment is still God putting us on a path. But this is a firmer word. See, before I said, you know, Precepts is God gently directing your path. This is God authoritatively saying, this is the way to go. Go this way. And I think sometimes in our culture today, um, in, the, in the American church, and, and, and don't, ever let, don't ever hear me say God's love is not important. <laughs> His love is so vast, so amazing. And, and I preach the love of God, and He loves us dearly. But don't ever let his love for you confuse you to think he's like you and that he's not your authority. The commandment is an authority. God has the authority to tell you what to do. Don't ever let his love for you confuse you to think he doesn't have authority over you. He does. Have you ever met a parent who was just their child's friend? Oftentimes when that happens... And don't get me wrong, we love our kids, we love them to death, and as they become more adults, we become more friends and less, you know, authority, right? Like, I don't have much authority over my son anymore, he's out of the house, he can do what he wants. But I, when he was young, when he was one to five, I was his authority. This is the way it is, son. Do it. Now, when he was 13, it would have been a little more challenge, right? <laughs> How do I get this 13-year-old to do what I want him to do, right? And over the years, I gradually, I was gently direct, directing him at different points. But even when he was 13, if he said, I'm going to go do this, and I said, no, you're not. <laughs> he better not, right? Because I'm the authority. And sometimes we think, we look at God and we say, God, I know you said this, but you don't know my, you didn't, when you wrote that, you didn't have my situation in mind. You ever been there? Come on now. You've been there. You didn't have my situation in mind. If you, had been, if, if you could rewrite that for just this situation, I know you'd write that differently. <laughs> nope. He's your authority. And even though you think you know better, even though you think I'm smarter, I've got the right direction. He is your authority. Don't lose sight of that. And his authoritative direction in your life, it enlightens your eyes. See, when you submit to his authority, you start to realize he did no best. He did no best. I can think a couple years ago, our family, I did not want what God was bringing into my life. And I thought, you know, your authority here, God, I think... I think you're making a mistake. <laughs> you ever told God he made a mistake? Yes, you have. Come on. You know you have. Maybe you didn't say it out loud, but you thought it. And then I stand here today at Norman Baptist Church as pastor here. I'm like, oh, you did know better. <laughs> Your authority was right again. And he's enlightened my eyes. He's given me sight to see he knew best. His authority gives us sight. 
Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Now you may think the fear of the Lord, well, that, how is that special revelation? Because isn't that our response to God? Fear. And by the way, when you, think, when you see the word fear, you could put the word faith there. To fear is to revere God, to give Him His due, give Him His honor, and that means you believe what He says, and you do what He says. You obey Him. That's fear. And so really you could say, the faith of the Lord. But here when you see the fear of the Lord, don't disassociate what causes the fear of the Lord from who God is. The idea is God is so wonderful, so magnificent, so above us, that it causes fear in us. And how does he reveal that to us? Through his word, through his son, through his Holy Spirit, through his special revelation. And he causes us to fear him through that. And it's clean. The idea here is it's ceremonially clean. I almost can't say that word. Ceremonially clean. <laughs> Too many syllables for this simple bumpkin here. Uh, but it's clean. It means that that priest was made clean. He could go before God. You could, you, if you weren't clean, you couldn't come to the temple. But if you were clean, you can come to the temple. If you're unclean, get out of the camp, right? Stay away. But when you're clean, you can come. When we have faith in the Lord, when we fear God out of a response to His wondrous beauty, to His amazing glory, to His grace in our lives, when we fear Him that way, it allows us into His presence. Hebrews talks about how we can come before the throne of grace and find grace. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Go to the throne of grace, you find grace. Find grace and mercy in the time of need. If you have trusted Jesus Christ, if your faith is there, you can walk into the throne room. So, that doesn't excite you? Come on! That's God. You can go into the throne room of Almighty Creator, Infinite God, right now if you want to, and find grace from Him, find mercy from Him. Because through Jesus Christ, He makes you clean. It endures forever, by the way. We're brought in right standing before God forever. I'm in right standing today. I'm in right standing tomorrow. I'm in right standing in a week from now, in a month from now. I'll be in right standing until eternity. You say, but pastor, I'll probably mess up this week. Oh, I'll probably mess up before I leave the building today. I don't know, but I'll still be in right standing. Because it's Jesus that gives me right standing. It's Him. It's my faith in Him. It's, it's the faith He's given me to have in Him that gives me right standing with Him. It's Jesus, not me. And it allows us to endure forever in His presence. Wow. Boy, the working of the Word is pretty strong, isn't it? Let me come to the end of verse 9. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The rules are the judgments of God. His decisions. And they're trustworthy. <laughs> you ever listen to the media and a case goes before the judge and you know, you know what should happen. And the wrong thing happens? Like, a lot of times? <laughs> right? How come, how come one judge can make a decision this way and then the next judge that goes to makes a decision that way, right? Because their decisions are not trustworthy. <laughs> God's decisions are trustworthy. They're true. He doesn't fail. He knows it all. You know, sometimes maybe this judge just didn't have enough information. Sometimes this judge has an agenda, right? God, he's got one agenda, and it's truth. <laughs> It's truth. And he's going to separate out at the judgment the righteous from the unrighteous. He's going to separate out the righteous from the unrighteous. Now, again, we're only righteous in Christ. So if someone sits here and says, you think you're righteous? Only because of Jesus. Without him, I'm about as unrighteous as they come. 
I'm righteous in Jesus, but he's going to separate out those who are in Christ and those who are not, the righteous from the unrighteous. And those who are in Christ learn to love righteousness, don't we? We learn to love righteousness and hate unrighteousness. Those who are not in Christ just love their unrighteousness. You know, if you were to ask the average person in our community today, do you want to go to heaven? I I've asked that question a lot of people. <laughs> I've not had a no yet. Unless it was a sarcastic no. Oh, I'm going to go to hell. All my friends will be down there. We hear that sometimes, but that's just foolishness. That might be the fool, right? If you ask anybody, do you want to go to heaven? Yes, yes, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Then, then ask them, do you want to live a righteous life with righteous people here on earth? <laughs> no, no, I love my sin. I want to live. Then why do you want to go to heaven? Heaven is a place where there's no unrighteousness. You don't want to go to heaven. If you, want, if you want to go to heaven, why do you want to live a righteous life here with righteous people? You don't want to go to heaven. Oh, you just want to avoid fire and brimstone and, and, and lake of fire and, and, and outer darkness. You want to avoid that. But you don't want righteousness. Not if you live your life in unrighteousness. See, there's no one who would say they don't want to go to heaven. One call to live a righteous life very few find that path, right? And when Christ makes us righteous, what's it do? It gives us the motivation to live a righteous life. It gives us the motivation, and he starts to change us little by little. Now, someone in here may be a new believer. Someone watching online might be a new believer, and you say, but I trusted Jesus. People come to you sometimes after they, after they receive Jesus Christ, and they come to you and say, I can't be a Christian. I don't think it took. Why is that? If you knew my last month, I am not living righteous. I'm a mess. And if God really saved me, wouldn't I be living different? You know what the best question to ask that person is? Before you were saved, any of that stuff ever bother you? Oh, no, it didn't bother me a bit. I lived like that, didn't care. Why does it bother you now? Oh, you're learning to hate your unrighteousness. Jesus is causing you to hate your unrighteousness, and he's causing you to start to love righteousness. Oh, friend, that means you are a believer. <laughs> That's the strongest evidence you can get. So you're learning to hate your unrighteousness and love righteousness. And it brings us to righteousness all together, the Word of God does. It brings us to that place in eternity where the righteous will be together forever. I want to challenge any people who are maybe watching online and you say, well, I don't need to go to church. I can catch church online. You know, and there's others who say, I'm a Christian, but I don't need to be in church, right? You've heard that. You know, you have to be, a, and you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But the reality is, if you're a Christian, you're the church. It's just the way it works. <laughs> but there are, there are many who say, I don't need to be, go to a church, and church is full of hypocrites, and like the famous saying is, you know, there's always room for one more. Um, come on in, right? We welcome you. <laughs> because, yeah, I, I am essentially a hypocrite. I profess one thing up here, and there's times in my life where I live the opposite. You say, you're a pastor. Yeah, I'm a human. Yep, yep, all pastors are human. And I can struggle in various areas, and we might even talk about that today as we move on. But the reality is, is I want to challenge anyone who says, I'm a Christian, but I don't need the church. If you don't want to be with the righteous here on earth, why do you want to go to heaven? Why do you want to go to heaven if you don't want to live with the righteous here on earth? And I know I'm preaching to people who are here, so let me preach the camera maybe for a moment. If you don't want to be the righteous here on earth, the local church, local body of believers, and I know some of you are watching, you couldn't get here because you live far away. I get that. But there's a local church where you should be. And I, and I could be flattered in my pride that you watch me online, but the reality is you need to be in church. Listen to a, a local pastor that can minister to you. You need that. And if you don't want to be with the righteous here on earth, why do you want to go to heaven? Where the righteous are all together. I look forward to being with... I, I tell you all the time, Sunday is my favorite day. Why? Because you all come. It's pretty lonely during the week sometimes. <laughs> And the righteous come together, and I love it. You know, we're going to have a meal afterwards, and I'm looking forward to that. Because when I'm up here, I don't get to interact a whole lot, you know. Get to see your faces, and y'all stare at me for about 45 minutes or so. And then 
I, I, I look forward to having the meal afterwards. We can interact, all right? I hope, I hope all of you will join. Because I love being with the righteous. Because they encourage me. Be, be, because I struggle throughout the week. And I need someone else to kind of kick me in the backside and say, hey, you know what? You need to change. I need that. We all need that. We need to be together. And the Word of God brings us that way. Verse 10. We need to move. So you see the working of the word in those three verses. Now let's look quickly at the worth of the word in verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. First of all, we see that the word is to be desired worth more than gold. This week, if you paid attention to the news and what's going on with the stock market, you have watched war over gold. <laughs> Pursuit of wealth. And I don't even want to weigh in except for to say, you know, I don't have a lot of sympathy for people who have billions that lose millions. It don't bother me. <laughs> I'll say that. I mean, if they earned it and they have it, that's wonderful. I'm not trying to take it away from them, but it just doesn't bother me. <laughs> but they pursue wealth. And you've got these competing factions, you know, you've got the common Joe like me, you know, who's, who's trying, to, trying to find a way to, to game the system to make money, and then you've got people who have billions that have been gaming the system for years trying to make more money, and what are they all pursuing? More gold, right? Give me more gold. I want more gold. I want more. I want more. What did Rockefeller say? How much is enough? Just one more dollar, right? That's, that's how it is. It never satisfies. The word should be like that. Just give me more. I pursue it. I pursue the truth of God. I want to know him. I want to know who he is and what he says and what he thinks. I want to know his opinion on something. Oh, it's not opinion. It's fact, by the way, when he thinks it. But I want to know. I can't wait to get more of what he has to say. That's how the word should be. But then he also says it's sweeter than honey. You see, I find it interesting, like Rockefeller said, how much is enough? Just one more dollar. It's never enough, right? When it comes to gold, it's never enough. When it comes to honey, I don't pursue it like gold. But it can be satisfying. <laughs> Maybe for some of you, I should change this to brisket, you know, or, or something like that. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> it's more savory than brisket. <laughs> Whatever your thing is, that's what it is. It satisfies. Brings you satisfaction. It's not like gold in that sense. So it's like gold in one sense, but not in the other. You want to pursue it, and when you find it, you go, oh, that's good. I love it. It brings satisfaction. The Word of God is, has tons of worth, tons of value, and it brings satisfaction. And then, he, then David here writes in verse 11, he starts to give a warning. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. There's a warning of the word here. Let's take a look at that, the last part of verse 11. In keeping them, there is great reward. There is warning that there is great reward to be gained. Now you say, well, that doesn't sound like a warning. Well, hang on. You see, if, if you were to be in a race, let's say, and you said, eh, I don't care who wins, you know, you know you could win. But you just don't want to put forth the effort. And then at the end of the race, you find out if you'd have ran harder and won, there was a huge reward for you. You'd have been like, well, if I'd have known, I'd have put some effort in, right? And so there is a good warning to be found out that there's great reward. And you know what? There's great reward in living the Christian life and following Jesus. There's great reward in that. Because there's a judgment seat of Christ coming. And there's, I want you to understand the judgment seat of Christ. I, I don't know if it's always been taught well, and I don't know that I understood it well until the last few years. But you don't, you're going to heaven if you come to the judgment seat of Christ. It's, it's a judgment of works in a sense. Not because you're already righteous, you're already coming to heaven, but now it's like, you know what, if you have, if you have served me in my name and done things for my glory, that's silver, gold, precious stones. And the things you've done for yourself, the things you just did selfishly, your sin, all that, that's wood, hay, stubble. And there's going to be a fire, and the wood, hay, stubble is going to burn up, and the gold, silver, precious stones will remain. And that's reward. And by the way, when you get that reward, you realize, I didn't really do this. That was Christ in me, and you throw it back at his feet. <laughs> but how disappointing to be at the judgment seat of Christ and you know, your friend over here has got, a, got an armful of reward to throw back at Jesus' feet, and you've got a couple of pebbles in your hand. 
right? Like, I could have had more. I wasted a lot of my Christian life. And by the way, I've already got a bonfire getting prepared for me. You know, I mean, I've been a Christian 40 years. I've got a lot of wood, hay, stubble. I do believe there's some precious gems and some gold in there, but it's a huge, I got more of the other right now. May the last half of my life, or I don't know if I got a half left, but may the last part of my life be more about precious stones, gold, and silver, working for Jesus, right? There's great reward in obedience. By the way, I would even say, and I, we talked about this in class a little bit, there is reward even in this life for living according to Scripture because your life is different. As I obey, I find satisfaction and reward here. Now let me warn you, if you're an unbeliever, obeying those things, it might make your life easier. In fact, sometimes it does if you're a non-believer. Because Satan doesn't mind if you live a moral life. He's opposed to Jesus Christ. He's not opposed to morality. And so if you live a moral life and die and go to hell, he's perfectly content with that. But there is some sense of reward even in this life for the unbeliever, but it's not any reward beyond this life, and it's just a comfortable life here, which might be a bad thing, because if you're too comfortable, you might not realize you're in, you're in need, and you need a Savior. You need rescue. And so be careful with that. If you don't know Jesus, and you say, well, I'm going to obey the Word just to have a more comfortable life, and it may leave you lacking in the end. You don't want that. But there is reward to be gained for the one who obeys, who, who takes the Word there's a warning from the word for that. And then we see in verse 12, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults or hidden sin. It reveals hidden sin. As you spend time in God's word, you will have hidden sin reveal. Sin you didn't even know was there. You know, there's things in my life that, that God is helping me learn to beat today that I didn't even know I needed to beat 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> you know, there's attitudes in my heart. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was... I was there the whole time. I've been sinning in this hidden sin for years. But as you spend time in His Word, it just reveals. And He continues to sanctify us. And I bet you I'll preach a message in 15 years, and maybe I'll hearken back to this day and say, you know, there were sins in my life I wasn't even aware of when I was preaching that sermon that continue to get revealed today that I'm working on. That may happen because that's the process of sanctification. But we all have hidden faults. And praise God, through Jesus Christ, I'm declared innocent for all those hidden sins. I'm innocent. I'm just before God, even from the hidden sins I have no idea about. That I can't confess because I don't even know they're there. And I'm declared innocent because of Jesus Christ. And the Word reveals that to us. It reveals hidden sin. And then we see next, it restrains presumptuous sin. Look at verse 13. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Presumptuous sin is sin that you do, you know it's sin, and you do it anyway. And we all have them. There's things we know, I shouldn't do that. Many years ago, I struggled with pornography. I knew it was wrong. And I bring that one up, you know why? Because what the, what the statistics tell us is, what is it, like 95% of men struggle with that? The other 5% are liars. Because <laughs> it's a struggle that, that, that can dominate a life. And I was, I was willing to let it dominate me so much that it could have cost me my family. I let it dominate me. And I knew it was wrong, but I didn't care. Because I was just serving myself. And I have found this in my life, that as I go to the Word of God, it restrains me from that. It holds me back from that. As I continue to believe the truth of God's Word, and it transforms my mind. Let me just say, when it comes to those dominant sins, whether it be, you know, for somebody it could be pornography, for somebody it could be alcohol, for, for somebody it could be drugs, for somebody it could be pills. I mean, it, it could be a critical spirit. I've had that dominate me before. Some of you say, ah, I know what that's about, right? It could be anything that dominates you. You know what's wrong, but you continue to go back to it. Let me tell you what the first step that helped me was. And I had to do this with critical spirit, too. I had to say, because the Bible says confess your sins, right? 
If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. It says confess your sins to one another, too, by the way. Ooh, that gets a little uncomfortable, Pastor. Yeah, we're supposed to do it. But one of the things I had to do is realize my confession was lying. Because I would go to God and I'd say, God, would you please take this presumptuous sin away from me? I hate it. And that was a lie. You see, I think it was Bonnie recently posted something about liver and onions on Facebook. <laughs> right, Bonnie? <laughs> and I replied, I said, there's not enough ketchup in the world to cover that up. <laughs> See, I hate liver. I've only had it, well, I, I guess I've had it maybe once or twice, but. <laughs> Bill says you have to know how to fix it, okay. <laughs> I don't care how you fix it, I don't want it. I hate it. And you know what? I never find myself in a room by myself going, ooh, liver. <laughs> Why? Because I hate it. You're never going to catch me eating liver. <laughs> but you could catch me doing sin. You could catch me doing sin I knew was sin. You could catch me doing that. So did I hate it? Wow. Oh, I loved it. You say, that's gross, Pastor. It is. It's wretched. It shows you who I am. It shows you who God is, that he's redeemed me and changed me, despite that sin in my life. And he was changing me in that moment. But I had to confess to God the truth. God, I love my sin. And I know I shouldn't. And I need help, because I can't stop loving my sin. So I need you to stop me from loving this thing anymore. Help me to see it like you do. Help me to hate it like you do. So I want to get rid of it. So I want to spit it out of my mouth. Help me with this, God. And through his word and through others, God transformed me. And you say, would you say you hate it today, Pastor? I hate it more than I did. But I'm weak. And I just have to put a million barriers in my life so I can't get, it can't get close to me again because I don't trust myself. And that's how we deal with sin, by the way, is we just, you know what, I don't trust my, I'm weak. Praise God, he's strong. But I don't trust myself, so I put barriers in place. My wife can see anything she wants to see of mine. I don't care. The other day she got my laptop. I have no idea what she was doing. I don't care. It's all there for her to see. Don't matter me. Why? Because I want that accountability. I want those barriers in my life. Do I hate it? I do. But I wish I hated it even more. I don't hate it like God does yet. That's glorification time. <laughs> I look forward to that. I'm being sanctified. I just tell you, if you have a life dominating sin, whatever it is, maybe step one for you is, God, I love this. And I don't want to love it anymore. Take the love away from me of my sin. Let me love you instead. And, and then get into the word and let it teach you. Hang on. So it warns us from, or restrains us, I'm sorry, from presumptuous sin. It warns us that way. And then lastly, he closes in verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You know, one more warning I'll give you from the word. It's going to result in transformation. You spend time in the word, meditating on the word, believing the word, and it's going to begin to result in transformation. The words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart will start to change. God's word is powerful that way. It, it, remember what I said before, it renews our mind so that it sinks into a belief in our heart so that it transforms the way I live. That's what the word of God can do for you. It changes us. To live a life that's holy and blameless before God, if we were to connect it back to last week. Application this week. Now, I'll talk about this in a moment. Let me just read it for you. Read your Bible this week, looking to find one of each of these. I don't give assignments very often. You got an assignment this week. I want you to read your Bible this week, and I want you to look for one work that God's doing in your life or that God, God might want to do in your life. One work that you can find that he's, he's working this text in my life. He's working this verse in my life. Find, find one place where you just say, this is worth so much to me. 
this text, this verse, it means so much to me. Find that this week. And then lastly, find a warning. Where do you need to be warned? Find that in the Word this week. Go do that. Now you'll notice that it did not tell you to read your Bible every day this week. Did I? I just said, go, go do this. Why? Shouldn't you read your Bible every day? I want, I want to tell you something. Um, I grew up, you know the song. Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, right? right? I, I, I learned that song, and, and I was taught, and I'm sure we, they were taught here too, because this church is so much like the church I grew up in. I mean, it's, it's almost scary. It's weird. But that's, that's what I was taught, and I was told, you know, a good Christian reads their Bible every day. Have you heard that? A good Christian reads their Bible every day. And my, my, my question that today is, so for 1,400 years when many people didn't have a Bible in their hands, they weren't good Christians? I can't even find in the Bible where it tells me to read the Bible every day. Now, I do see where it tells me to meditate on it day and night. But that's a little different than reading it. You see, what the early church did is they heard it. James says, don't just be hearers of the word, because most of them couldn't read. Don't just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. God is not looking for better Bible readers. He's not looking for people who read the Bible more. It's not what he's looking for. God wants us to be of those who take something from his word and we see a change that he's making. We say, I'm going to believe that. I'm going to let that sink into my heart and I'm going to let that change my life. He wants doers. He wants you to be holy and blameless, not just a reader of the Bible. And some of you get very nervous when I say this. Like, are you telling people not to read the Bible? Look, if I tell you the worth of God's word, if I tell you it can transform you, if I can get you to trust God so much to know that I need to know what he says, I believe what he says, I want to know more. Why do I have to tell you to go read it every day? If I could get you there, I might never have to tell you to ever read it. Amen. And you may not read it every day, by the way. See, here's what happened to me as a young person. is I was told to be a good Christian, you got to read your Bible every day. And, and by Tuesday, I forgot all about it. And by next Sunday, I heard I need to read my Bible every day, and I, I must not be a good Christian. I would rather you take something from what we read today and just chew on it all week long and let it transform you this week than to spend time reading and not let it impact your life at all. You see, the Bible is not mystical. It's not some mystic book of incantations that you read and then it just transforms you. That's not the Bible. What it is, is it will transform your mind as you believe it and then sink into your heart and it will change your life. And the result God desires is that change, that conformity to his will, to his word, to his son. That's what God desires from us. Christianity is not about being a good reader of the Bible. If you boil it down to that, then, then, then you're mistaken. It's about transformation. And if I can teach you that, then I don't have to convince you. It's like, I understand some of you are very disciplined, right? You get up at the same time every day, and, and, and so you, you do your Bible reading at the same time every day. And that's great. If it's transforming your life, don't stop, okay? Keep doing it. Me, I'm more like a guy that says, I got these 10 things to do today. I'll get them done. And I don't schedule it one right after the other. Like, some of you are like, how can you live your life that way, Pastor? It's just how God made me where I just know i got to get these things done, and I might get the last thing done at 9.30 before I go to bed, but it'll get done. Because I, I just, I'm just not a scheduler like that. You know, I schedule appointments because I have to. You know, I mean, if I'm going to meet somebody, I have to be on time. So I do that, but I don't schedule each task all day long. Some of us that are like that have, have, have struggled with the Bible reading thing. Got to read it every day, every morning. Every, every. And I'm just telling you, learn to love God's Word. And, and you may, like, like when you're going through life and you got a question, do you ever think, I wonder what God thinks about that? I do that all the time. 
Something will come up in our culture, and I'll be like, I wonder what God thinks about that. You know what I do? I jump on Google, and I start saying verses, Bible verses I can read, and I go to those verses, and then I read that verse in context, and I'm like, eh, that doesn't really touch on it, and then what else does God have to say about this? What's God got to say about gay marriage? We know what he has to say about it, but that's, that's one cultural issue that many aren't looking to the Bible for. They're looking to culture for, right? They're looking to make people comfortable instead of saying, you know, what's God's word have to say about it? You need to learn to love the word of God. You need to learn to love the worth of the Word of God and not worry about the, the, I need to do this every day. Shed that. Don't be a slave to that. The Pharisees did that. They said, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, you're not a good person. You're not following after God if you don't do X, Y, and Z. That's what the Pharisees did. Shed that and just learn to love Jesus. Learn to love His Word. Learn to appreciate God for who He is and, and magnify Him all day long and learn to be curious. God, what do you think about this? Huh? You ever ask God those questions? Something comes into your mind and you're like, I wonder what God thinks about that. I'm going to go find out. That's how we should approach the Word of God, like hungry and thirsty for what He has to say to us. I hope you don't mishear me. I never said, don't read your Bible. <laughs> never said that once. <laughs> Would not say that. In fact, if you're hungry and thirsty, you're going to be in it probably more than you ever have in your life before. Just don't make it a ritual, a ritual that thing makes you think you're now closer to God because you've checked a box every day. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that your desire for us is to transform us into that image of Jesus Christ. And Father, he did spend time studying because we know he was able to quote so much scripture. And he spent so much time in prayer but Father, I know when Jesus was here, it wasn't just a ritual he did to say he checked the box, but it was because he, he had that intimacy with you as his Father, and, and he was separated, so he wanted that closeness, and so he continued to pursue relationship while he was here on earth. Father, that's our role, to be like Jesus that way, to pursue this relationship, to know you more deeply, to recognize who you are, I just thank you that you have given us your word. You could have left us, I, I think back 14, 1500 years of the church, really the, the common person could not get a hold of your word. We are so blessed to have it where I had left my Bible someplace in the building, so I used my phone this morning and was able to get it. What a blessing we have to have it accessible, ready at our fingertips. Father, help us not to make, make that the end all and be all father but help us to realize we're doing it in pursuit of relationship with a holy god with a father who loves us um, to know the son to magnify the son and we know that it's your holy spirit that teaches us that illuminates it as we go we're grateful people and uh we want to sing now of your amazing grace together and we look forward to doing that in jesus name amen